So the goal of the panel discussion is to answer your questions um, and to ping back and forth uh, a bit between us. And so the first question um, is, current best clinical pearls in managing venetoclax um, regarding prolonged cytopenias, active infections, and drug interactions regarding dose delays and dose reductions? Which I think is a great um, question, and I'm going to let my colleagues go to that. I just want to make one comment, um, which is that Dan Pollier just published like a minute ago in Leukemia, a clinical management article about um, venetoclax combinations, which I read quickly and which looks very on point in terms of many of these issues, if you want to see that um, in print. But I'd like to hear from uh, my colleagues that first, let's go one at a time. So how have we been managing the prolonged cytopenias? Sangmen, if you want to start. So Venetoclax uh, combination is uh, myelosuppressive, and it may be more myelosuppressive than um, single-agent decitabine or azacitidine. So in practice, we hold the venetoclax. So we typically do a 21-28 day course of venetoclax, and typically what happens to these patients is they become very profoundly pancytopenic. We typically do a bone marrow biopsy, and if they are very hypocellular, then you hold and you wait. Um, uh, typically, you support them as transfusions. Um, if they are hypocellular, um, you can support with growth, fac growth factors until they recover their blood counts. If they do not recover blood counts, then you should um, uh, repeat bone marrow biopsies to see if um, it is really hypocellular versus um, uh, disease, a residual disease. Um, venetoclax, I, we, we want to stress that venetoclax uh, combinations uh, shouldn't be given in a four-week schedule. I think um, you have to monitor these patients very carefully and monitor their cytopenias. And especially if they're remission, then you need to wait for their count recovery before proceeding to subsequent cycles. Pinkle, did you want to add anything to that? Um, my uh, only point is, um, so once the patient is in remission and we have um, uh, cycles that are ongoing, typically the um, duration of uh, venetoclax is shortened from the initial um, time, and it kind of de it's patient-dependent, depending on how cytopenic they become during the cycle. So the first consolidation cycle or maint maintenance cycle, however you might um, call it, um, it, it, you have to keep a really close eye on these patients because you're, you're understanding their pattern of cytopenias in remission, and you uh, certainly don't want somebody to get a high chance of infection um, uh, w in remission because that would not be um, you know, ideal. So, so uh, appropriate dose reductions um, in terms of both uh, the, um, the the duration of venetoclax um, first. Um, so it could go from like three weeks to then two weeks, depending on how the cytopenias um, are proceeding. And sometimes even lowering the actual dose um, of the medication from 400, which is the approved uh, um, uh, regimen, to 200, depending on how the cytopenias are, are proceeding. And as to the question of um, the drug interactions, those are an extremely important um, one. There is a big interaction of venetoclax um, with the azoles, as we know, and fluconazole um, it has, it requires a 50% dose reduction, which is on the label. Some of the other azoles, like posaconazole, which um, some centers do use for prophylaxis, the, the dose reduction is much higher, so we many times use 100 milligrams if somebody is on posaconazole. Um, and these these changes are dynamic, so many times, so once in CR, uh, patients go out, we start the se second cycle, and when the neutropenia comes along, we, we would initiate uh, um, these antifungal agents along with the dose reduction of venetoclax. So this is a very involved process um, um, along the way with, uh, with uh, the goal of which is to identify for each individual patient um, what is their ideal dose that, um, uh, that is enough, but also um, does not expose them to unnecessary toxicity and cytopenia. I would um, summarize by saying it's very difficult, very different, should be very different viewing a patient before remission and after remission. So in general, the world has moved to somewhere around 21 to 28 doses consecutively of venetoclax for remission induction. 
This is real remission induction, so you're seeing the patient several times a week in the office as a minimum or hospitalizing them. It's worth it to hospitalize the patient if they cannot reliably see, be seen and transfused in the office. During the neutropenic period, you're gonna carefully follow the dosing guidelines with azole antifungals, although there's controversy as to the use of them. Most AML doctors do use the antifungals and dose reduce the venetoclax. Once your marrow is better, however, the last thing you want to do is hurt somebody in remission. And I do see lots of patients being referred in who are on their 60th day of venetoclax with no dose interruption and with terrible cytopenias. So you want to get them into the remission tolerating the cytopenias for that period of time, allow them to recover, use growth factor support if you need to, and then subsequently, as both of my colleagues were saying, you really want to touch feel a little bit how many days of venetoclax uh, will be tolerated in subsequent cycles, and we've seen 7, 10, 14, and this becomes anecdotal and not data-driven. Let me move on to some other questions. Um, one is, I'll answer quickly, if a patient has an inversion 16 and a FLT3, um, what trumps, yeah, I, I was told not to say Trump at all during the conference, so that, but that I didn't. So the, uh, the concept there is that that is a reasonably frequent pairing, and um, in general, we have been treating the core binding factor as the driver of the disease and using a gemtuzumab-based uh, induction without adding in um, a FLT3 inhibitor in addition to that. So it hasn't really been tested whether or not you can do the combination, for example, of 7 plus 3 plus mitostorin plus gemtuzumab, although people have tried it anecdotally, we feel that the, and that the core binding factor drives uh, or trumps the FLT3 mutation, and those patients also are typically not recommended for allotransplant in first uh, remission, even though they have a FLT3 mutation. Um, it should be noted that a lot of those FLT3 uh, mutations are actually TKDs. Now, uh, next question is, um, what do I think about uh, post-transplant, what do we think about post-transplant maintenance in FLT3 patients, serafinib, mitostorin, gilteritinib? Sungmin, you want to take that one? I think there may be some benefit, but I think there's clinical trials ongoing. Um, there are several uh, FLT3 inhibitors post-transplant, uh, cronolinib, and newer agents that are currently ongoing. So. I think um, it's not, I don't think it's necessarily standard due to added toxicities with uh, FLIP3 inhibitors, but there may be data forthcoming regarding maintenance with uh, FLIP3 inhibitors. Um, so it, with regards to post-transplant uh, maintenance, if, you know, if we look at the Ratify study, um, there was one year of maintenance for mitostorin post-transplant, but the way the trial was designed, um, you know, the approval is not, um, for maintenance, although there was some um, benefit to the mitostorin, there are caveats to it because um, TKI, uh, the, uh, these kind of um, FLT3 inhibitors are not um, tolerated the same way pre-transplant versus post-transplant. Most patients with gut GVD and um, thinks they do have some toxicities. Um, so in patients, um, in, sele in selected patients, um, that is a, that is a, a valid um, um, concept to do um, FLT3 maintenance. There are data on um, sorafenib maintenance that were recently um, uh, published, uh, where the sorafenib maintenance appeared to um, improve, um, uh, you know. Uh, relapse-free survival post-transplant, but um, this was done in the era where mitostorin, most of these data um, were at the time when mitostorin was not used um, a frontline for induction uh, uh, chemotherapy. So uh, whether this would hold in a mitostorin-treated um, patient is not uh, known. But the general idea is that if somebody is tolerating it um, well, um, some kind of maintenance strategy is not uh, unreasonable. My personal bias is that um, I do it. I think that FLT3 um, inhibitors um, in post trans maintenance probably work, and I do try to apply them. I think that, as you've heard, there's a significant question as to which one to use, and I have to say there is some whimsy, some clinical trial design, and some clinical circumstance that will define which inhibitor to use because it's complicated. I thought I agree with Pinkle that the serafinib data are quite interesting, and there might actually be different biology behind serafinib's activity post-transplant given its widespread um, immunologic effects as well. 
well. So I think, but I think that conceptually, ongoing use of inhibitors post transplant um, uh, is is probably right. Now I'm trying to see how tight we are. One more question. One more question, boss. Okay. So. Uh, Next question, in view of the possibility to introduce maintenance post high dose therapy in AML, do you see autologous stem cell transplantation coming back for the treatment of good and risk, uh, intermediate risk patients? So I'll answer that one quickly. So I suspect actually that um, the author of the question may also have read the newly published paper from Jemima, um, which involves a randomization to autologous transplant for patients who are MRD negative with newly diagnosed disease. So so I will hold you in suspense as to my answer because I'm actually going to present a slide on that shortly in the um, uh, AML-MRD discussion. But I think that conceptually, post-remission therapy is actually going to be a huge discussion. And I look forward to having options for um, defined subgroups of patients to offer them that they don't have to go on to a stem cell transplant. And Dr. Von Vizine, who is our transplanter, is not here yet, so I can say that quickly.